Shubha Mahalaya, Shakalke. Good evening to all of you. Uh, on this auspicious day of Mahalaya, which ushers in the Pujra and the Navaratri, as it were, in several parts of the country. And we have the honor and pleasure of listening to Professor Brian Hatter today. Uh, he's going to speak on Vidya Sagar. Uh, probably facets of Vidya Sagar that are unknown to us. Uh, we were just discussing with a few of us earlier that when we are in school, unfortunately, uh, we come to read very little about Vidya Sagar. Whatever we gather about Vidya Sagar is much later in life. And I'm sure that still there are other facets which we are not aware of. And I am sure that this evening, uh, Professor Hatcher is going to throw light on all that. So may I request uh, Dr. Jayanta Sengupta, Secretary and Curator, to kindly introduce the speaker for this evening before he takes the microphone. Good evening, or good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to today's lecture on Vidyasagar, articulate subject of the non-Renaissance. It is our privilege and honor to have with us here today to deliver this lecture. The, one, the, the foremost scholar on Ishwar Chandra Vidas Hagar and one of our preeminent scholars on religious reform and vernacular modernity in colonial Bengal and India, Professor Brian Hatcher. Uh, we have started celebrating the bicentenary of Pandit Ishwar Chandra Vidas Hagar's birth and as an expert on Vidas Hagar's life and work, Professor Hatcher is here originally to participate in a two-day conference at the Asiatic Society where he delivered the keynote address on the 26th, which many of you may have already listened to and which it was my misfortune to miss because I was traveling back from Mumbai. But when I originally proposed this lecture to him, Professor Hatcher graciously and readily agreed to speak and to speak on a different aspect of Vidyasagar's life and work than those covered in his Asiatic Society address. So on behalf of everybody in the Victoria Memorial Hall and on behalf of everybody present in this hall, I thank Brian for being here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Brian Hatcher, of course, doesn't need any introduction to this audience, but in case some of you are not yet familiar with the entire range of his scholarship, I will say just a few things about him. Uh, educated at Carleton College, California, and then at Yale and Harvard, Professor Hatcher was the McPhee Professor of Religion at Illinois Wesleyan University for nearly two decades through the 1990s and 2000s. Since 2010, he has been the Professor and Packard Chair of Theology at Tufts University. His research focuses on the transformation of Hinduism in colonial and contemporary South Asia, with a special interest in early colonial Bengal. His numerous publications explore issues of religious reform, vernacular modernity, the work and significance of translation, and the colonial life of the Sanskrit language. An expert on Vidashagar's life and work, he is also known for his interpretations of bourgeois Hinduism and modern Hindu eclecticism. Professor Hatcher's many books include Idioms of Improvement, Vidashagar and Cultural Encounter in Bengal, which was published by the Oxford University Press, New Delhi, in 1996. Eclecticism and Modern Hindu Discourse, published by the Oxford University Press in 1999. Bourgeois Hinduism, or Faith of the Modern Vedantists, Rare Discourses from Early Colonial Bengal, published again by Oxford University Press in 2008. Vidyasagar, The Life and Afterlife of an Eminent Indian, published by Routledge in 2014. And his latest book, Hinduism Before Reform, which is forthcoming from the Harvard University Press in March to 2020, early next year. He has also edited Hinduism in the Modern World, published by Routledge in 2016, and co-edited, along with Michael Dodson, Transcolonial Modernities in South Asia, also published by Routledge in 2012. His forthcoming book, Hinduism Before Reform, refor sorry, Reform, sorry, Hinduism Before Reform, yes, uh, uh, due out next March, 
offers the first ever in-depth comparison of the early histories of the Swami Narayan Sampradaya and the Brahma Samaj. And for his next book-length project, Professor Hatcher is seeking to map the spread and chronicle the history of the Dasnami Sampradaya in southwestern Bengal between the 18th century and the present. Research for this project has also been supported by fellowships from the American Institute of Indian Studies and the American Philosophical Society. And during the spring of 2019, earlier this year, Professor Hatcher was a JP and Bina Khaitan visiting fellow at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. The abstract that Professor Hatcher has provided for today's lecture states very tantalizingly, and I quote from the abstract, at the risk of reawakening old debates, this lecture seeks to press at a new way for thinking about Vidyasagar's modernity and to highlight one element of Vidyasagar's character that may still inspire efforts to cherish life against the structures of liberal modernity that support exclusion and privilege. So we wait with bated breath to know what that one element is. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Brian Hatcher to speak today on this subject, Vidyasagar, articulate subject of the non-Renaissance. Professor Hatcher. Before uh, Professor Hatcher takes the microphone, I request Jointo to kindly hand over a little memento on behalf of Victoria Memorial Hall to Professor Hatcher. Generally, the question and answer session follows the lecture. Uh, but today, I want to ask Professor a question already now. Uh, when you deliver lectures in the United States or in other places, um, does one have to remind the audience to switch off their mobile phones or keep them on silent? Here we don't. They do it on their own. It's a bit of a convention in yeah. America, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, they do. But here, our audience is wonderful. You don't need to remind them at all. They automatically switch off their phones yes. or put them on silent before they come into a lecture. <laughs> so with that, the microphone is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jayanta, for that uh, exceedingly generous introduction. Uh, but most importantly, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. It's a real pleasure. Um, and as you mentioned, had the good fortune of being here to speak at the two-day seminar at the Asiatic Society. And, and yet, it being a keynote, I was told I would only have about a half an hour to speak. And I felt, as you can imagine, many things I'd like to say and more than I could say in half an hour. So when Professor Sengupta approached me and said, would you be willing to speak again? I said, most certainly, because I have other things I'd like to get off my chest. So I'm going to do that today. And I have a fairly, this is longer than 30 minutes. Uh, it should be about 50 minutes, I hope. I, I don't want to try everyone's patience. Um, but I'm going to try to run out some interpretations and see what you make of them. Um, less in terms of new discoveries of facts and more in an attempt to offer a new reading of how to think about Bidashagar's significance. Um, can you all hear me well in the back and you can understand my, my Minnesota accent from America? <laughs> I hope I won't speak too, I tend to speak quickly, so if I'm going too fast, someone let me know. Yes, yeah, so I've called it Bidashagar, articulate subject of the non-Renaissance. And over the course of the paper, I'll try to make clear what all those elements uh, are supposed to mean. So I recently came across what I take to be a very apt description of Bidashagar. And in this description, the author writes that, quote, he sees society as a complex of forces which are capable of practical adjustment by intelligently inventive policy. He sees government as a source of such policy, and it's government in the larger sense embracing the alert and articulate citizen, as well as the formal agencies of legislation and administration. He's aware of the dynamism inherent in modern society, yet this awareness arises out of a growing realism in outlook rather than out of any new philosophical insight." End quote. Now, when you think of Bidashagar's manifold engagements with pressing issues of his day, from education to social reform to securing the health and welfare of Bengalis, it really does seem as if he was constantly on the lookout for ways to translate his own alert awareness of existing problems to his uncanny ability to articulate a course for change while also looking to the colonial government 
for assistance in the form of meaningful policies and even legislation. So this combination of articulate advocacy and the presumption of government support, we could say, was almost a hallmark of Bidashagar's approach to reform. Now the funny thing is the quote I just read you was not written about Bidashagar at all, of course. That's the trick. Uh, it was actually not even written with India or with Bengal in mind. It comes from the pen of uh, a historian of Tudor England by the name of Arthur B. Ferguson, who was writing in the 50s and 60s, actually. Uh, I came across it somewhat by chance in a bookstore and had this wonderful title, The Articulate Citizen. And I thought, well, that's an interesting concept. So I began to, you could already imagine what I'm thinking. Well, I, I think I know an articulate citizen. So I picked it up and began thinking about what the author was doing. What he does in the book is he looks at a range of Renaissance political thinkers active in the period running up to the English Commonwealth, so sometime mostly during the 16th century. And Ferguson claims that what distinguished many of these intellectuals was a particular posture and attitude about change. He noted that rather than focusing on changing the existing political structure, they focused on ways to use government to search for both causes and then remedies for what they took to be evils in society. In this way, he noted, they were united not so much by any kind of philosophical vision. They had no grand philosophies. They were just looking for a kind of uh, practical solutions based off of the data that they collected through empirical observation of their world. He called these, Ferguson called these men commonwealth men and said that they were striking for their scientific efforts to analyze the workings of society and also for their basically fairly conservative approach to life and society. That is, from the medieval period, they'd inherited a largely, what we could call, organic model of society. Every member in society occupied something like a fixed or even sanctioned by God, some kind of role given by God, that worked together in a cooperative fashion as the entire body, organic body, to promote the overall welfare of the body politic. But the key thing here is that the Tudor period was a transitional time that also was witnessing the rise of new merchant actors with a vigorous spirit of enterprise. So change was evident on the ground even if these thinkers were still oriented more towards a stable view of the past. So Ferguson says these Commonwealth men had a freshness of ideas that stands in contrast to the rich legacy of medieval life that they carried forward. As transitional figures, and these were officials, pamphleteers, preachers, a range of people. They were laying the ground for English modernity, even as they apparently worked to hold their existing world together. So we have this interesting, uh, what we could almost call Janus-faced attitude, looking forward but looking to the past as well. There's no consistent attempt to really come up with, as I said, a ph philosophy. Instead, it's fairly pragmatic, looking for what he calls practical adjustments that will help make the world a better place. So when I read Ferguson uh, and his account of these Commonwealth men, as I said, I couldn't help but thinking about Bidashagar. I thought like them, quoting him again, he is aware of the dynamism inherent in modern society, yet this awareness arises out of a growing realism and outlook rather than out of a new philosophical insight. And I just ask you to remember how much ink has been spilled over the question of whether Bidashagar was an atheist. Was he a Hindu? Did he believe in God? Did he not believe in God? These questions have, uh, we've become obsessed with them and we can't ever really find a good answer to them. And, and what Ferguson suggested to me was maybe we don't need to look for someone always to have a philosophy. We don't need to find out what his theological vision was. We could simply try to see what it was he attempted to do in a more practical level. And I, I confess, my first book, which uh, Professor Sengupta kindly mentioned, Idioms of Improvement, in there I was driven by the same need to kind of demonstrate that there was a consistent worldview to Bidashaga, or even a religious worldview. And this came out of my training at Harvard, I would say, and uh, the com compulsion to say something on that question. On, I'll just take the moment to say, uh, since it's the anniversary year, uh, I'm really happy to say that I was able to, OUP let the book go out of print, uh, I've gotten my rights back from OUP and the book will come out in the spring from Primus. Uh, so I'm told it will be even available at Boimela. So wow. keep your eyes open, idioms of improvement, I hope, if, if all goes well. Um,
then you can take me to task for attempting to prove that Vidyashagar had a religious worldview. <laughs> um, so anyway, if only I, I wish I had found this, found this book when I was doing my original research, because it seems as if he pines, provides a one-sentence answer to all of us who have been consumed by these questions. In Vidyashagar, we have a figure who saw change taking place around him and who responded with a kind of conservative realism that was far removed from philosophical vision or any kind of political rallying cry. His approach was, if you'll bear with me, empirical. It was pragmatic, and it was oriented toward finding resources for addressing change through purposive, what Ferguson called purposive human action. Now we could link that to what Ashok Sen in his book, uh, Bidashagar and His Elusive Milestones, said about Bidashagar, that he sought social change through purpose of human action and predicated success in this regard on the garnering of consensus among a nascent colonial public and with the support of the British colonial government. His, Bidashagar's, was a project to articulate, and if you read Ashok Shen, I find that he uses the word articulate quite a few, articulate or articulate uh, several times. It's interesting to find this sort of coincidental connection, but to ar articulate a new kind of individuality and a new vision of social well-being. At the same time, Vidyashagar, it strikes me, is transitional in the same way that we could say these Commonwealth thinkers were trans transitional. He wasn't particularly eager to upset the status quo uh, as much as he was invested in rooting out the cause of particular social evils, polygamy, child marriage, the ban on widow marriage, etc. Now, that would beg the question of what the status quo was, and I understand, and there's not enough time to go into the changing political economic situation in colonial Bengal and how everything really wasn't a static world at that time at all, but the point is there's, a, there's an element in Bidashagar's worldview which does take for granted, if you will, the, the organic world of a kind of Shastric, uh, dharmically ordained universe in which people have particular social roles. And I'm not really interested either in defending Bidashagar's modernity here. If anything, what I want to suggest is that maybe we can find a new way to tackle another of these perplexing questions. So we go back to Amalesh Tripathi and the traditional modernizer idea. Was Bidashagar traditional? Was he a modern? Was he a modern traditionalist or a traditional modernizer, right? We play with these words. Maybe there's a way to get out of that binary of tradition and modernity by thinking about the question in a somewhat different way. And I think the key there is this concept of transition, again, that we think about transition. One of the problems, I think, is we tend to read history teleologically. We, we know where history is going, or at least we think we do. We know what the goal is. Uh, we know where the race is headed. The race ends up in the independent nation state of India, or it ends up in a renewed Indian or Hindu self-consciousness, if you will. And so we know that's coming, and then we want our figures from the earlier period to have anticipated it, to have seen it, and to have pointed the direction to it. But of course, Bidashagar didn't. He wasn't thinking about an independent nation state, and he wasn't thinking about revitalized Hinduism or anything like that. He was looking for change. He was looking forward, certainly, but he was also working with existing conditions in the same sort of fashion that Ferguson spelled, spelled out. Some of this I, I started thinking about when I was drafting the chapter that I wrote for the new comprehensive history of modern Bengal that's coming out from the Asiatic Society. Uh, the chapter is the era of Bidashagar. And in the course of that chapter, I try to use Bidashagar's life as a lens for thinking about just what changed between the early colonial period and the late colonial period because I've become convinced it's important that we don't talk about colonialism as one monolithic thing, or even the 19th century as one consistent time period. But there, there are significant differences between what was happening in 1820 and what was happening in 1870, and the conditions of possibility for people. I think we have to keep that in mind. Bidashaga was born into the one world, into the early colonial world. He learned to negotiate its possibilities, and he knew its pitfalls, and he was significantly rode his own talents um, and used his social acumen to what was already, by the mid-century, looking like the zenith of his sort of professional accomplishment, you know, became principal of the Sanskrit College. But then post-1857, of course, in 1858, he resigns his position. And, and as we know, things change drastically in India. That we, we go on our way to the Raj and the different conditions of racism and all these other factors. 
So Bidda Shagar's retreat from a, official service, of course, didn't mark the end of his uh, pragmatic career. He didn't retreat into obscurity, and he didn't give up trying to advance change. He stuck to his same methods. He stuck to his same pragmatic approach. And he still could look to the colonial government for assistance in addressing problems such as polygamy. And of course, he became involved with his opinion on the age of consent bill as well. So what he pressed on toward was, I would say, a social picture that accepted the reality of a sovereign ruling authority, which by his day had become, of course, the British. And it seems in many ways he could accommodate that with a view of a Brahmanical or a Dharmic view of society. Uh, and I wouldn't want to call that medieval. I think the term medieval, Ferguson could use it in 1950s, 1960s, but we wouldn't probably want to use it today as it's too loaded with normative conceptions. But we can think about that organic conception of a pre-modern world that Bidashagar, I think, still accepted. I think if you read how he thinks about the government, Bidashagar stepped into the shoes of the proto... Or he, he saw the British, excuse me, stepping into the shoes of the prototypical Raja, that the British should act like a ruler whose duty it was to attend to the welfare of their realm, keeping in view the principles of Dharma. He could make his appeals to them for change on that basis. And I think that's one of those conceptual parallels between Bidashagar's approach to change and that of these commonwealth men. How did he do this? What were the tools of his trade then? The tools of his trade, as we know, in some sense, were the Shastras. He, he looked to the Shastras. And he was, of course, raised in a pundit family and educated at Sanskrit college, so he came by this quite naturally. It was very understandable that he would look to the Shastras to ground change. But he needed something more than Shastra, too. And here we can think once again of Ferguson, because one of the things I think we overlook about Bidashagar and this is one of the themes of the paper, I think, is about the articulacy. It's not just Shastra, but he yoked Shastra to empirical observation. He was gathering data in the way those commonwealth men were. He saw problems, he tried to document them, and then he used those problems to make an appeal to the government for remedies. That might be one index of his modernity, then, in this transitional phase. He's even like Ramohan before him, he linked the campaigns for social reform to evidence that could be gathered, analyzed, and presented to the public through the press and to the government by, by means of petitions, etc. When we think of the great social reform campaigns from opposition to Sati to widow marriage, you tend to think of these competing factions, you know, the Hindu Sva, et cetera, and the Brahmo Samaj, et cetera. You think of conservatives fighting liberals. I think we tend to forget that there was also a bit of um, data collection going on. People were gathering evidence to make their cases. Um, and in Bidashagar's career, of course, was long before the age of colonial statistics. There was no census yet. And the, even the robust Indian scientific community had not come into being in the way we would think of in the late colonial period. And, and you see this, if you look at uh, Chintamani's book, uh, Indian Social Reform from 1901, you see that the book is uh, able to make cases, cases about the same issues around widow remarriage or child marriage, drawing on statistical data that had become quite available by the early 20th century. In Bidashagor's day, those st tabular summaries and statistics were not available, so he had to kind of gather this information himself. Maybe the data collection is a little more rudimentary, but I think it's still very effective, and I think it's important that we uh, pay, atten pay attention to it. So you have Shastra, you have data, and then you have his instinct to think historically and critically about texts and about history. You know, you see all this come together, even a bit of sociology in his 1850 tract, uh, Balo right, on the evils of child marriage, where he gathers medical evidence, <laughs> psychological evidence, what we could kind of say sociological arguments about the pros and cons of child marriage, right? The, the detrimental effects on boys and girls to have them marry at too young an age. And in Bahu Bibahu, Vidashagar, I would say, demonstrated, like a commonwealth man, that there was a utility to gathering evidence if you wanted to persuade the government, in this case, the colonial government, now, in that evidence, I want to expand our notion of empirical evidence a little bit 
to, to say that one of the things that makes his, I think his um, approach really unique is of course he was a wonderful descriptive author too. He had a wonderful pen and he could not just gather data, he could put it into form in which it reached the readers in a compelling fashion. You think of his fictional creations like, well they weren't creations but his own recreation of figures like Shakuntala and Sita. They're legendary already, we know about that. And I, I've had argued in an essay in, a, in another context that actually if you think of the Shakuntala story, it's about a, a, a woman who's not recognized by her rightful husband. Right? And I make the case that what Bidashaka was always trying to do, whether in Shakuntala or in the Hindu widow marriage tracts, was to get Bengal to recognize its women, to see them and to see their plight. It's as if otherwise they just couldn't see what was right in front of them in terms of the sufferings of Hindu widows. Of course, and, and in those works, Shakuntala is a very powerful emotional work, as is, as is Sita, you know, Sita Ranavas. Um, we see this, though, also in Balo, in uh, Balo Bibahir Dosh, Bahu Bibahu, Prabhavati Sambhashan, these vignettes of abuse, of suffering, of sorrow. They, they work powerfully as a kind of evidence that should be shaping the Bengali attitudes about a particular social problem. So I want to read you, if you'll bear with me, this is my translation of a, of a piece of uh, Bahu Bibaho. And just think about how the way he uses his storytelling abilities to bring you to see something. So Bindashaga writes, there was once an eminent Kulin who lived in a certain village. This already sounds like a folktale or something. He had married three or four times, Two of his daughters were born in another village where he had married. They spent their lives in their maternal home. Their mother's family took care of them and when the time came would give them away in marriage. The Kulin never had any news of them. Then, due to bad luck, the fortunes of their maternal families turned sour and they could not be given in marriage. The eldest was at that time 18 or 19 years old. The youngest was 15 or 16. When they, sed when they seduced a certain man, they were kicked out of the house. When their father eventually heard this news, he wondered what to do. He went to Calcutta to consult a relation. As he told the relation his sad news, his eyes filled with tears, saying, Brother, after all this time, my lineous cottage of fortune, my Kulalaki, has abandoned me. My life is for naught. All is lost. Why has the goddess turned on me? His relation said, Well, this is the evil result of your never learning anything about your daughters. Well, Vidashagar says, the Kulin thought about it for a while and decided to go to the house of the man who had taken his daughters away. He begged him to have mercy and let him take away his daughters for three months. He promised to return them after three months. Seeing the Kulin's sorrow and distress, the man agreed. The girls were delivered into his hands, that is the Kulin's hands, and he took them with him to his own home. He let word get out that one man had stolen the girls in order to give them in marriage, but after much effort, the girls had been recovered. So he made up this story. Then, so they could not run away, he posted a guard to watch over them and take care of them. The Kulin then sent about, gathering the funds and locating a groom to whom the girls could be wed. A month later, at the end of Bhadra, he returned, having amassed enough wealth and having located a six-year-old boy who would serve as the groom. The boy had learned something about the girls and was only willing to the arrangement if he received more than the usual wedding gifts. The very next night, the wedding rites were performed. The Kulin's honor had been saved, and those in attendance agreed that the goddess of the Kula was not fickle. Right? The very next day, the new husband left for his own home. A few days later, the two girls disappeared. They haven't been seen since. And what need was there to know? They had saved their father's honor. The selfish father afterward had no more worries. What's more, he had promised to return the girls in three months' time to the man who had made off with them. Shortly after the wedding, he returned them as he promised. The main thing is the goddess of the Kula remained true in her love and compassion toward the Kulin. It's a great slander to say the goddess of fortune is fickle. Clearly, the goddess of the Kulins does not deserve such a reputation. <laughs> Many people know the details of this story, Vidashagar says. They get that many people know the details of this story, but that hasn't led any of them to lose their respect and affection for the Kulin. So you have this irony in there, right? The, who says the goddess of the Kulins is fickle? And then he ends, but with that note, you all know this, he's saying. This is right in front of you. You all know us, know this, but no one's doing anything. 
Now, if, if I had read it to you in Bangla or if you read it on your own, you would recognize the prose as vintage Bidlashagar, I think. It's direct, it's clear, it flows forward with the momentum, it, there's that irony in there, that sarcasm, and it's got that moral spirit to it at the end. I want to add to that the suggestion that this is also a kind of production of evidence. He's giving you evidence. He's making a case. And a lot of these, he's saying, you know this. Here, I put it right in front of you, this evidence. Now do something about it. There's no theory here, as Ferguson would say. There's no grand philosophy. There's no theory of gender. There's no political theory of liberation. It's just a kind of data meant to move people to take concrete steps. In this respect, a narrative like this provides a kind of explanation for the root causes, greed, ignorance, selfishness, etc., that underlie polygamy. The remedy, of course, is some kind of rajanayam, some kind of government law, as Bidashagar says, to help correct these abuses. Now, you pair those narratives with the lists that you have in Bahu Bibahu, and you see this data collection get more complicated. So in the fourth section of Bahu Bibahu, Bidashagar lists over 120 individuals giving their place of residence, their age, and the number of marriages they had contracted. And in another section of the book, he gives a, a list just for one village in Hooghly District where he found some 60 individuals with anywhere from two to 10 wives, and he lists all that. So he's listing this data for you to, to make you confront it. He uses that to refute the claim that he hears all too often. So many people tell him, don't worry, Kulin polygamy is going away. It'll wither away. But his evidence is there to prove that to be a lie. And the key to disproving, as he says, is to do sabishesh anushandan, careful research. Do, look into it, right? As to those who say polygamy is a social evil that should be rooted out by the agency of society and not by government, Bidashagar says he tries not to smile at that. Because he says, yes, it would be delightful if members of society would get rid of polygamy, but I don't see that happening, he says. That's not possible. People are too selfish, and they're not discriminating good from bad. So say what we will about this strategy. It does seem to me to mirror something like the articulate citizenship highlighted by Ferguson. And it's Bidashagra's commitment, not just to this or that reform, but to the ideal of a shared public discourse and reflection on the gathering of all evidence, shastric, imperial, empirical narrative, that sets him apart from his opponents. I think this is really one of those things that makes him remarkable, um, and why we are celebrating him here 200 years after his birth. Now, pressing ahead, <clears throat> we have to get to this non-Renaissance part. <laughs> you have to understand, I found this book, it's written before the post-colonial turn, it's a it's a book that's about Renaissance Europe, and I saw myself going right back down the line of saying, okay, Bidda Shagar really is evidence of an Indian Renaissance. And I, but I myself have been sort of vocal about we need to get rid of that concept of Renaissance or at least do some serious thinking about it. So I thought, do I really want to take up this topic now and make this argument because I seem to be endorsing the Renaissance thesis? You know, I had read Borunde and Ashok Sen and all those people back back when I was in graduate school, and I, I bought into the idea that it's, it's difficult to talk of a, a true renaissance in Bengal when you have the, the constraining evidence of the colonial rule, right, and capitalist uh, production. We, so we can, we can, we can debate our, uh, ourselves about whether it remains an appropriate rubric or not, but mo moving on, you can just imagine I was a little bit loath to go back down that road but in the end, I chose to take this risk for two reasons. Because with, his emphasis, with Ferguson's emphasis on the transitional character of the Tudor period, it struck me he gave us a useful tool, actually. And what the tool is, it's being aware of this Janus face quality, the looking ahead and looking back at the same time. That maybe we don't have to buy into the high-flown rhetoric of awakening and renaissance and rebirth and all of that. But we can just say that since the Commonwealth men in the Tudor period pointed toward the birth of English modernity, we can see in Bidashagar the first light of a similar sort of modernity in Bengal. The transition is the key. The nature of Bidashagar's accomplishments and the limitations come into view in new ways, I think, when we take this, this kind of perspective. The second reason I took the risk of raising this theme of the Renaissance 
is precisely because I wanted to go back to those early critiques of the Bengal Renaissance and remind us of one key differentiating factor that was brought into view by those earlier scholars, and that's this colonial context. And here, though he had no intention of doing this, Ferguson helps us stress the difference because for him, the best way to think about the posture and methods of the Commonwealth man is to call him, he says, an articulate citizen. Well, the articulate citizen is the person he was describing in that quote I read you at the very beginning. I'll just give you a section of it again to remind you. The articulate citizen is the one who sees society as a complex of forces capable of practical adjustment by intelligent policy. The articulate citizen sees the fundamental weaknesses of human beings and not holding any brief to transform them, just seeks to find remedies for their misbehavior using the government policy. Now, Bindashaga wrote for an increasingly literate and print-savvy public. He looked for causes, like, causes for evils like child marriage and polygamy. He proposed remedies in the forms of requests for government action. But the one thing he was not, despite momentary uh, or duplicitous claims by certain colonial thinkers that this was coming, uh, Bindashaga was never really a citizen in the sense of the word that we think of certainly not in the sense employed by Ferguson. He remained a colonial subject. And so I, I have subject rather than citizen here, articulate subject. But as Asok Sen long ago pointed out, it was beyond Bidashagar or even many of his peers to even articulate what Shen called the art objective contradictions of the system in which they were compelled to work and live and dream. Right? So that we have to recognize that constraining colonial factor to differentiate from the Tudor context. The genius of Bidashagar's articulate mapping of problems uh, and provocative appeals for government remedy were always limited by that subjecthood, colonial subjecthood. And I think then Ashok Sen was no doubt correct to have spotted what we might call a fundamental disconnect. In fact, this is the phrase Shen uses, a disconnect between articulation and fulfillment. That that's why these are the elusive milestones, right, for Bidashagar. He could articulate what he wanted, but he couldn't achieve it. Confined to a colonial status that offered no hope of achieving true citizens' rights and prerogatives, Bidashagar's articulate voice and his reasoned assessment of evils remained to a large degree abstract, as Shen put it. There was no real hope of guiding Bengal to social renewal since the hard work of thinking change remained confined to what Sen called tiny intellectual groups who couldn't get any wide you know, this whole question of the organic intellectual, couldn't gain any wide consensus. Now, Ferguson takes pains not to paint the work and attitudes of these early tutors as fully modern. And again, this is the transitional theme, and I want to hark on that again. They continued to defer to this older order, even as they began to adopt certain distinctively modern approaches to assessing cause and remedy for social error. And if we think about these intellectuals, in England in the same way, perhaps we come upon a way out of this age-old Bengal Renaissance problem. The solution would lie not in proving or disproving that modernity had in fact dawned in India. The solution lies in recognizing that modernity was only coming into being in both Britain and in India in the same time period between the 17th and the 19th century, centuries. As Peter Vanderveer suggested, modernity, if you think about it, is really co-produced in both sites during this period. You can't judge the one against the other because in the entangled world of empire, they were neither one in advance of the other. The whole idea of advance, we could say, grounded as it is in liberal Western narratives of progress, is itself a kind of artifact of the emergence of a particular form of religion, almost a, what Vanderveer would call the religion of modernity. What I call in my forthcoming book that Professor Sengupta was nice to mention, I call it the Empire of Reform, which begins to take over in the late 19th century. What I want to say is that in Bengal, rather than talking about modernity lagging behind modernity in Europe, in Bengal, as in early Tudor England, intellectuals were moving between two worlds, with modernity as a kind of horizon more than either an accomplishment that we think happened in England or a failure that we think didn't happen in Bengal. Bidashagar could thus be one compelling example of a transitional figure in 19th century Bengal, and we can call him this articulate subject of a non-Renaissance, 
but a non-Renaissance not in the sense of failure, but in the sense of our inability to judge an arrival of that sort without presuming that we know already what it looks like. The imperial co-production of modernity belies our ability to tag it in one place and point to its absence somewhere else. Thus, we might even argue that, like the Commonwealth Tudors, Bidlishagor is an example of an intellectual in the process of being what Vanderveer would call converted to modernity. We're watching as both groups, the Tudors and Bidlishagor, are converted to a new way of addressing the world. And no less importantly than in Britain, the modernity he was coming to address and articulate was comprised, in some sense, by being tied to a capitalist economy and a political system invested in the celebration and protection of property. And now I'm heading toward the last part of the paper. In Britain and in India, social change could manifest itself to some degree as little more than epiphenomenal in relation to more foundational import of bourgeois interests. And now I want to turn to a very different book than Ferguson's. I want to refer to Michael Hart and Antonio Negri's book, Commonwealth. Because I, at one point in there, they point out that Ranajit Guha had found it, uh, he had been stymied by the fact that the British came to India with Enlightenment values, and then they enacted a very feudal system called the Permanent Settlement. And Ranajit Guha thought, why? How could that happen? And, and Negri, Hart and Negri say that, that wasn't any kind of compromise or disconnect. That, that's precisely the expression of what they call the Republic of Property, that Western modernity and liberalism are predicated on the inviolability of property. And so the Permanent Settlement is the actual perfect expression of that. So there's not a disconnect between their values and what they instituted in Bengal. It's the outworking of it. Okay, We have to address that. So if modern bourgeois politics is the republic of property, then the very idea of promoting a common good, or as we have in the Tudor period, the commonwealth, that's already in some sense compromised by the need to maintain the conditions for economic prosperity among landed classes necessarily at the cost of suppressing or controlling the multitude of those who are propertyless. It's in recognizing this and in rethinking the meaning of the, what Hart and Negri call the multitude of the poor through the lens of biopolitics that they propose a pathway, and I won't get into their pathway, towards what they call a social subjectivity that results in a radically plural and open body politics. They're trying to imagine what they're going to call alter modernity. It's not tradition, it's not modernity, it's something other, it's an alter modernity, because modernity for them is too closely linked to the rule of property. Bringing the poor, they say, bringing the poor in from the margins is a way to envision what they call a project for revolutionary transformation. Now, bear with me as I work through this last part. Um, maybe we have in this the way out of a pernicious bind that tends to make us think that the early Tudors, again, were on their way to political freedom while Vidyasagar remained a passive colonial subject. I want to say, if the idea of common good, if the idea of a common good was a horizon for the Tudors, it was for Vidyasagar as well. In both cases, we find people trapped within the framework of a still largely conservative political and social matrix. In Vidyasagar's case, his was also an exclusionary and a repressive political system. So both the Tudors and Bidashaga were looking for possible futures. If there was no renaissance in Bengal, it's wishful thinking to say that the Commonwealth ever really fully manifested itself in the bourgeois politics of Western liberalism, too. That's a kind of a failure in its own right. So to judge Bengal's failure against that is uh, misleading, if not disingenuous, at the least. I won't go too much further into Hart and Negri, and, and I confess to getting lost to, to, by some of their Spinozian philosophy, which I can't quite follow. But uh, this was, to me, a compelling avenue into the last point I want to bring together for the paper. And if you can bear with me, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, there's two more concerns I think we can find an answer to. One concern is the question of whether, and I think I've alluded to this already, whether there was any awakening to modernity. Okay, there's that concern. The other concern is that one piece of evidence which suggests the Renaissance in Bengal was only partial in some sense unrealized, which is the solution to this is the fact that so many of the great reformers, if you think about it, were themselves elite, upper caste, propertied men. Their visions, from Brahmotheism to widow marriage, remained somewhat clueless 
we can say, not to be unkind, but somewhat clueless about what we would call the multitude following uh, Hart and Negri. They didn't have their eyes on the multitude of the poor. With respect to these concerns, I would say probably Ashok Sen was correct to identify a fundamental and troubling disconnect again between articulation and fulfillment. And the reason for that is property, right? Property. And Vidyashaga was just one of many influential, reform-minded Bengali intellectuals who failed to press very hard at the privileged situation of Zamandar landholders. If anything, he seems to have accepted their social status and called upon their patronage as being necessary, just as he thought an imperial of tutelage under British imperial rule was not necessarily a bad thing. Right? So we have to have to look this in the eye and accept it. And as for him being implicated in the r rule of property, don't forget he's, he built himself this beautiful house in Badrabagan, which is a nothing if not an emblem of bourgeois aspiration, right? And so, and again, I'm not trying to malign him, but I'm trying to insert him in a particular kind of context, critical kind of context. So he was awakening to a certain sort of colonial modernity in which property and status could be wielded to useful ends. And the deference of Bidashagor or Budeb or Bankim to the hierarchies of Shastra in this context becomes somewhat explainable. We don't have to, and Tupin Wright Chowdhury pointed this out years ago, we don't have to label these anyone like that reactionary because they look to the Shastras. They weren't religious fundamentalists. They were just conservatively minded when it came to politics and this organic social world. They took the hierarchies of property and capital and caste, et cetera, as for granted. The failure of property and elite reform to reach the multitudes only speaks of this reality. I find some promise in Hart and Negri's call for us not to reject modernity as much to seek this thing they call alter modernity, which for them would be an encompassing and polit plural political vision that doesn't prematurely prep human promise within the walls of capital. And toward this end, they advance, they advance what I think is a really innovative hermeneutic or interpretive device that we can use to rethink one of Bidashagar's greatest successes as a representative, not of bourgeois reform, but in fact, as someone who was connected to the multitudes. And this came up a little bit in the, in the two-day conference, that one of the things that makes Bidashagar remarkable was his ability to connect with common people. He, did, he came from humble origins, Right? He was not like Ramohan from a highly elite uh, family background with generations of court linkages and Indo-Persian kind of sophistication. He got a humble pundit family from Birshingho. Um, but he also seems to have, and he still lives on in the hearts of many people in these folk stories and things that we all know about Bidashagar, his sort of humility. So I want to bring that forward. In, in their book, one other thing that Hart and Negri do, and this will be the, the, the sort of summation of what I try to do. And bear with me, it's a little bit of another detour. We have to go to Immanuel Kant, the, the Enlightenment philosopher, uh, because they use him to, to, to show how we could get to alter modernity. And they do this by, many of you may know, Kant wrote this famous essay, What is Enlightenment? Right? Was, everyone was talking about enlightenment, so he was going to define what enlightenment meant. And if you know, he drew on the Latin poet Horace's words, sapere aude, uh, dare to know. That, for Kant, was the quintessence of the Enlightenment, dare to know. You need to move past all forms of what he called self-incurred tutelage. Don't let other people speak for you. Don't let other people tell you what to believe. Know for yourself, right? So the message of Enlightenment liberation that was Kant's, what Hart and Negri called, that was the, Kant's major voice. That was the major Kant. You know, they're going to distinguish between a major and a minor. The major Kant says, dare to know. And that's, they say, is the voice that undergirds modern liberal political politics, projects, excuse me. I can't develop all this, but this major Kant and the motto, dare to know, underwrites the modern republic of property as much as, because it represents the logic and goal of bourgeois aspiration around reform, progress, and the rule of reason. So what they try to do is link up, you know, the Enlightenment liberalism, right, to the ocean of the major Kant and dare to know. 
But then they say, and this is very clever of them, and I'm sure the Kantian scholars would hate it, but they say there's also a minor Kant, so a lesser Kant, if you will. And his motto isn't dare to know, his motto is know when to dare. So they're just having a little wordplay. This Kant, a reading that they arrive by reading Kant against the grain, is the key to an alternative rationality that can support, they say, creative resistance to bourgeois property. Knowing how to dare, they say, is the first step toward new democracy that would embrace the multitude and not just the privileged. Well, I'm here, now you can probably see this coming. Maybe there were two Bidashagars, a major Bidashagar and a minor Bidashagar. And I'm not saying this categorically as if this really exists, but this is a thought experiment. So the major Bidashagar says there's nothing higher than Dharma, the Shastras. His motto, if you have to give him a motto, Kant had his motto, so Bidashagar, the major Bidashagar's motto might be Jato Dharma Tato Jaya. Wherever there is Dharma, there will be victory. His is the truth of a Shastrically mandated, organic, hierarchical world that we could call Brahmanical society. So when Bidashagar employed the Shastras to promote change, he wasn't really threatening the rule of Dharma. He was working within the rule of Dharma. That rule is coterminous with the ordered structures of Bengali society. The hierarchical system of Jati Veda, Raja Dharma, etc. At least if we think of the rule of Zamandar authority and all of that. Now, that major Bidashagar is the one that also was the social reformer, the advocate of progress. I'm not trying to take that away, just as Kant and the project of liberation has been fundamentally transformative for Western modernity. The same major Bidashagar has been transformative for modernity in Bengal. I'm not trying to take that away, but if you think of Hart and Negri's argument, that also implicates Bidashagar in the problematics of liberalism. He can't, for that reason, give you, the major Bidashagar can't give you a path to revolutionary reordering of things. That's where you need the minor Bidashagar. But who is the minor Bidashagar? Well, I'm glad we have this portrait because everyone knows Bidashagar's visage and I think he, the, the brow and the gaze. That might be a clue to the minor Bidashagar in its own right that because we know that piercing intellect, that critical spirit, that satirical glint in his eye, the use of humor that he had, these to me I think are the keys to the minor Bidashagar. This is not someone who waves the triumphant flag of Dharma this is the guy who pauses to cast doubt, to call out pretense, to challenge abuse, and to shame the prideful. So I was trying to think of what the motto for the minor Bidashagar would be, and I thought he was very fond of this phrase from the Mahabharata, Dharma Syatatvam Nihitam Guhayam, right? The essence of Dharma is shrouded in mystery. So the major Bidashagar says, wherever there's Dharma, there will have victory. And the minor Bidashagar says, do we even know what Dharma is? Right? Can we be so sure? And since we can't know for certain, let's be careful and err on the side of compassion and justice. That's where the minor Bidashagar lives on, I think, and that's why he's such a favorite in the Bengali heart, because he lives on in these folk tales, poking fun at preachers, for instance, you know. Oh, you're gonna tell your, your parishioners how to get to heaven. You couldn't even direct someone to my house, he says, right? I mean, he has this kind of sense of humor, and he's, he's poking at authority and pretense. Like the minor Kant, the minor Bidashagar, we could say, knew when to dare. He knew when to dare. Could even be possibly offensive, certainly challenging, and many times unexpected, as when he resigned his post. His minor victories were many, and maybe unremarkable in some ways, but for that very reason, they gesture at a possibility for challenging the status quo and making the world better. Now, I, I could go into a, a parallel that I see just in the, in the Mahendralal Sarkar visited Bidashagar once and he left and he wrote in his journal, what a bundle of inconsistencies is a man. <laughs> and so we should hang on to that thought that people are complicated. I was thinking of Melinda Banerjee has a book in which he argues that there wasn't one Ramahan, there wasn't two Ramahans, there were three Ramahans. And they don't always even square with one another. And we just have to accept that this is 
how human beings are. They're not always internally consistent. They're not philosophical systems, they're people. I'm, I won't go into Banerjee, but I'm looking for that inconsistency because it allows a crack through which we could see Bidashagar, not just daring to know, but also knowing when to dare. So in Bidashagar's case, think about him resigning from the Sanskrit college. That was a rejection of bureaucratic rationality and the authoritarian control of a colonial administration. It was a bold assertion of a different kind of independence. You know, I'd rather sell potatoes, right? His jokes and his irony are another manifestation that you sort of gag reason, you choke it in the interest of provoking other kinds of insight. Hierarchy and deference might be one thing, but even the truths of Sanskrit could be turned against Brahmanical rule. So there's one wonderful passage. So when his friend and you know, his colleague and former friend, Taranath Tarkabachaspati, began opposing him over his reforms, then he wrote those famous pseudonymous tracts, right? Ati Alpaholo, Abarati Alpaholo, wonderful. But many people think, how could this man write such <laughs> very edgy, scurrilous kind of attacks on his friend? But remember, he takes on the character of the Ubujukta Vaipo, the competent nephew, and then he says, why did you do this? And I quote, well, my great shortcoming is that if I see an injustice, I can't remain silent out of deference to caste or kinship. After all, the Niti Shastra says, dosha vacha guru rapi, right? One must mention the faults even of a teacher. But, he says, these days things have gotten very bad. If upon seeing someone's error, you speak up truthfully for their own benefit, they take it as abuse. Consequently, in such situations, most people remain silent. But such restraints not fitting in the relationship between a competent nephew and his uncle. That is, I'm constrained to speak up both to protect my own dharma and for my uncle's benefit in this life and the next. So again, we have sarcasm, humor, but we also have him taking to task a very highly reputed, authoritative Sanskrit pundit like Tarkavachaspati. So here's the minor Bidashagra, and I'll close. Constrained to challenge Dharma in the interests of another Dharma whose truth might not be accessible to us. This is the Bidashagra who knows when to dare. We might say he speaks truth to power. When he felt constrained to speak that way, he did so against the dictates of modern colonial capitalist reason. He articulated a kind of alternate path. If one to, were to follow Hart and Negri, you could maybe say, in his most daring moments, he made subordination visible. And there too, think of all the stories in which he's mistaken for a Mali, or he has to put up with the humility of the principal of the Hindu college putting his feet on his desk, or oh, the shoe matter, right, when he's not allowed in because he has the chapels on. All these stories talk about subordination of one kind or another and his refusal to accept that kind of situation, right? He, in Hart and Negri's terms, often proceeded from indignation. And that's what led him to know when to dare. And I think even his self-effacing erasure, that, that humor that he used, was a way to distance himself from authority so that he wouldn't bind himself in the normal uh, structures of power. So, last paragraph. I know I'm stretching, stretching a lot of points here. I'm trying to advance some new way to think about Bidashagar, but I feel like we can go on gathering more data about Bidashagar, and, we, and it seems we continually find new, another letter or something new here and there, but we also want to find new ways to think about him, too. And on the 200th, I think it's a, a fitting occasion to try to stretch some new interpretations. I, so I risk this by way of saying, you know, maybe it's Bidashagar we should remember when we try to think of responses to the challenges that we face today when it comes to freedom, equality, justice for all. In the humor and the irony of the minor Bidashagar, perhaps we have a right to identify a kind of gesture toward alter modernities that don't rely for their legitimacy on problematic liberal notions of rebirth and renaissance, but press instead at knowing when to dare. It's admittedly this minor voice, and it's often lost within this larger major voice of the property, Republic of Property. But it's a, it has a lot of purchase in popular memory, as I've said. Bidashagar's jokes and his pushing back at power continue to resonate. We should honor those jokes and we should build on their promise. I would borrow the words of C.L.R. James and say that 
Unfailing humor is an assertion of life and sanity against the ever-present threat of destruction. Maybe it's utopianism to think there's a solution in this. But even David Harvey, who was critical of Hart and Negri's book, even after being critical of the book, he said, well, you know what? It's kind of utopianism, but we can't do without such utopianism in these times. Thank you. I don't know, do you? Thank do you? you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know if that, yeah, if that's custom, I'm happy to yes. take questions. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and thank you all for your patience. I know that was a lot to get through. Uh, thank you so much, Brian, for that, for that fascinating, you know, uh, lecture in which you have unraveled these nuances in Vidyashagur's life and work. I am, I'm sure you have many questions. So the floor is open. Uh, please ask questions. Please identify yourself and please keep your questions brief and pointed. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I'm not confident in English, so I'm going to in uh, Bengali language. Mr. Sengupto, he's there. Uh, may I hope that uh, he will convey my message to you. Asha kore je ami bujhte pare. Okay, okay. Ami onek dukkito. Ami onek dukkito. Asha kore. Okay, okay. Apni jeta bole chen asha dharan. Bishwe to sheshetti ke eshe je minor vidya shakur, major vidya shakur je thought apni place kore ne kani. Dutup jayega. Ami binoy ghos amader jiri lekho ka chen. Vidya Shagor is a Bengali Shomaj. So, I have read this book in a few years. I have written a book in a few years. Anyway, I would like to say that there are two points. I have been talking about the first time in the book of Bangalore, the first time in the book of Bangalore, the first time in the book of Bangalore. The first thing I would like to say is that Vidya Shagor is a good person. The first time I would like to say is a colonial Shomaj. And the first time I would like to say, ये पौंइत्रीस्टा स्कूल तत्कालीन ये ब्रिटिश शासक राज शिलो तारा ताके स्कूल माने नारी शिक्षा जिस स्कूल आ रखी ताके उन्हों मोती दे आयेगी तो ये विषय टा आपकी कोटो टालोक पास कोत्ते पारे हैं राइट राइट सो मेबी यू कैन समराइज़ या बिकॉज़ आई एम नॉट शर आई गट एवरीथिंग the question of why Bidyashagar went into a self-imposed exile yes, of, yeah. of sorts. Mm. That is that's one. Mm. And the second is why mm. these 35 the schools, schools were, permission for these 35 girls' schools were not given. Mm. Mm. Okay. By the government. By the government, in spite of Bidyashagar's best mm. efforts. Yeah. yeah. So well, I, I, in my, um, in the Bidyashagar life and afterlife of an eminent Indian, I, I went to Karmatar because I was myself intrigued by that move that he made uh, to kind of retreat. Uh, and I, I, I tend to believe there was a, a frustration. And a, in a, into my mind, that, that fits the frustration of the minor Bidashagar, who, who, who felt, you know, you can bang your head against the wall for only so long bef before you hurt your head, <laughs> you know, and so maybe, but think about that minor Bidashagar. What did he do when he went there? He tended to the Shantalis, he gave them medicine, he, he, they were his people. Yeah, and he didn't, he didn't make those distinctions of standing on, well, I'm a Brahmin and you shouldn't come near me and you should, you know. That, that's a rather remarkable index to me of that minor Bidashagar. That, it's almost an alter, alternate community he seemed to be looking for, whereas in Kolkata what he saw was factionalism and people arguing with one another but never accomplishing anything. So that, that would be how I would answer the the first question, which is, a, which is again, remains a really important one. Uh, and probably connects to the first one, in so, or the second one, insofar as that issue over the government funding being denied to those schools. Uh, to me, as I said, it's just a kind of him coming up against a kind of simple um, arithmetic of colonial budget keeping uh, and a sense that perhaps they link the, the budgetary reasons to a kind of disgruntlement at his own entrepreneurial spirit, right? That he would go forth and do all this work. And maybe, you know, maybe we would say he was premature in doing some of this without being certain, you know, you or I would make sure we had a signed letter 
uh, of agreement before we did anything. But he was willing to do it and, and in the aftermath pay for all that expense himself and go into debt over it. Because again, that was his conviction that had to happen. But um, maybe that's a point where the minor Vidashagar again collided with the, the problems that the major Vidashagar had been trying to navigate. He'd been trying to work within the system, working for the government, working with the government. But then at some point, there's the twain could not be met, right? Is that, yeah? Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Hmm. Yeah. That, uh, you have, uh, we know him as a humanist. Mm. So how could you locate him in minor or major or the combination of both? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, you know that's 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 a question that's linked to the question of modernity, to Renaissance, the the question of humanism, right? Because we associate kind of humanism with the European uh, Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment, and so I would say there's. There's probably a kind of alter humanism that would go along with an alter modernity. That, and again, I'm making this up on the fly, and I'm, I, I, I'm a, I have an interpretation here. I don't want to. I don't want to beat it to death, but I do think uh, we have to query even humanism itself, right? Because it's we we live in, by some accounts, a post-humanist age in which even the human now has been questioned. Because after all, we now recognize that the definition of the human tended to be European white men. That, that was the standard for humanity. And then everyone else was judged against that standard. So if we don't maybe even want to <clears throat> ascribe humanism to people. If it's, it, see, that's linking them back into that major world of the republic of property, if you will, and liberalism. And yet, we use that word with immense respect when it comes to Bidashar, because that, that man with the heart of a Bengali mother or whatever, I mean, we can't. We can't deny that, so we look for words, I think, to get at that. Uh, and humanism, you know, we have to maybe use it and then cautiously query it at the same time, if that's a, if that's a fair answer. Is that? Hmm, uh, we you. have a question in the back. Please limit yourself to one question and keep your question brief, hmm. right? I'm Priya Doshi. You know, I'm extremely intrigued by your, the subject of your, you know, of your lecture today because mm -hmm. to other common Bengal mind, to mm -hmm. the common Bengali mind, Vidyasagar is a plot of the Renaissance because he gave the true picture. He, since he was a great scholar in Sanskrit, mm -hmm. he pointed out the real truth within Hinduism. Mm -hmm. the, he, the Hindu religion was hijacked by a, a group of priests. Mm -hmm. So the common people couldn't really understand what he was. Vidyasagar, with his vast knowledge mm -hmm. of Sanskrit, gave the true picture of Hinduism. That look, this is the Hindu religion, this is Dharma, not what these priests are, have been fooling you. These priests have been fooling you, they've been mm. cheating you, they've been duping you. Mm. So for that reason, we, uh, Vidyasagar is a product of Renaissance. Secondly, his, you know, uh, uh, the Bangla language, mm. he, he, was, he acted as the midwife. Mm. He brought the Bangla language from the umbilical cord of uh, Sanskrit. Mm. So that way, Vidyasagar is, uh, 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 is a Renaissance figure from that point of view. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we get, and get one more question. thing, regarding Tarak Vachaspati, which you said, you know, Tarak Vasispati and Vidyasagar, though they had serious differences, mm -hmm. but when Vidyasagar was offered a job, a highest job in mm -hmm. Sanskrit, mm -hmm. he went, he, he gave it to Tarak Vasispati, ah. walked hundreds walked of miles, yeah. and offered Tarak Vasispati the job. Tarak mm -hmm. Vasispati embraced him and said, Vidyasagar, you're not a man, you are a god in a human form. Mm -hmm. So Vidyasagar, for his large-heartedness, generosity, is considered to be a Mahatman among Mahatmans. Mm -hmm. From that angle, we look at him from the uh, as a uh, Renaissance figure. Right. So okay. I'd like to have your you know yeah. take mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you so you see me challenging that by taking away possibly the possibility of his being a Renaissance figure, right? And I think this is the challenge of uh, uh, tackling the sort of conventional understandings, right? It's not, as I, as I said all along, not an attempt to belittle or, or demean his, his um, record or his reputation or his standing in the hearts and minds of the people, but it's a way to think about what are some, what are the, some of the limitations of invoking concepts like humanism, like modernity, like Renaissance, is sometimes we get so accustomed to using certain words and categories that we no longer see other things, right? And we forget. It's a process of forgetting. In order to use that category, we forget to think in other ways. This is actually the subject of my forthcoming book, which may, 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 may trouble people too, because there I take the very concept of reform, 
which has become so important for thinking about modern Hinduism, reformed Hinduism like Brahmo Samaj or whatever, and I say, what if we got rid of the category of reform? What if there's another way to think about modern Hinduism? And my purpose in comparing, uh, and pardon, this is not meant to be a digression, but the purpose in comparing the Brahmo Samaj and the Swami Narayan Shampardai is that they emerge in precisely the same moment and Swami Narayan is an exact contemporary of Ramohan Roy, the one in Gujarat, the one in Bengal, two different contexts. They both start new religious, I call them polities. I don't want to call them even movements or reform associations. And that, but I want to compare what's happening because I want to just, in the interest of seeing things anew, not invoke a category like reform or renaissance. So I take all your points. And this is the problem. I think in some, in, lo and behold, here I was finding in Ferguson a work that suggested a Renaissance analogy. And I couldn't resist employing it myself. So I, I feel the spirit of what you're saying, but I'm also trying to say, what's the cost of invoking, you know, we, we you say things that have become too comfortable, you don't hear them anymore. They just are mantras in a bad sense, right? They're just things that, okay, Renaissance man, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you for mm. an illuminating lecture. Mm. I'm Sukhendu Samajdar, uh, professor of uh, engineering Achha. at West Bengal University of Technology. Mm. At the risk of requesting mm. something repetitive, would mm. you briefly summarize this your take or your perspective on this non-renaissance part so yeah. that I can get yeah. it a little bit yeah. better. Thank you. I think it's, it's, it would be to slightly repeat what I've just said. I, you know, there's this concept of uh, in deconstruction that you use concepts under erasure. Are you familiar with this idea that you can use a word and then immediately erase it at the same time? This is a little bit of what I'm trying to do. And so you want to say that there's no, by having Renaissance there, I'm acknowledging almost there's a Renaissance, but then I want to put the non in front of it to say, but be careful, right? Perhaps Renaissance, yes, Renaissance, no, right? And in the major and the minor might be one way to think. The, the, the major narrative, this is what Hart and Negri are saying about Kant, the major na narrative supports the idea that there's a Renaissance of liberal modernity, progress, reform, right? And that's the story we tell. And it's an illuminating and, and, of course, it was an ennobling narrative even for Indians as they moved from the 19th and the 20th century and the work of gaining independence from colonial rule took place. But, of course, the gaining independence from colonial rule also involved buying into certain bourgeois liberal notions of property and class and things like that, which then persist post-independence and structure the, the, the way in which Indian society looks today. So maybe we need to then go back and ask, what if we... Are we missing something? This is the alter modernity. Is there another way India could be, right? If it had not, if it had not, or at least simultaneously embraced that, not just daring to know, but knowing when to dare, and reached out. Because their point is, let's try to actually live in a world where there's a commonwealth, where all people are included and access to things are, are shared instead of it being a kind of hierarchical, exclusionary polity. So I think that's, I'm sort of, have, having it and taking it away at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Professor Thak, I'm just digressing from words mm. on your title, right? Ah, yeah. Now, would you say he felt very oppressed as a man because mm. uh, I feel knowing Bengalis and being a Bengali, we are very emotional <laughs> about many other Bengalis. Mm. And I wonder why, despite his very powerful thinking and voice at that point of time against the British, why was there no, or was there any people's movement mm. uh, like we have today on the roads? So the slightest thing, the leaders are on the road with millions of people. Mm. And I'm sure even that time, uh, people were who looked up at him or who were not even educated enough to look up to him. Mm. Was, was there any conscious effort to mobilize this mm. kind of uh, thinking amongst the people of the land? Yeah, to, to my, and this came up in the two-day conference, right? People were, you think of uh, uh, Ramohan and the Brahmo Shumaj, you think of Dayananda and the Arya Shumaj, you think of any number of leaders 
who created a Samaj or a Sampradaya, something, some associational group to carry forward their vision, their work. And people were asking, why did Bidash Agar, such an, you know, such an entrepreneurial man who could start a printing press, who could found schools, right? Who could do all these other things? Why did he never create an association or some collective that would embody his values? Um, I don't know that we have, a, it's somewhere in the characterology of the man, I think, and I think some of that is that major and minor is perhaps fighting with one another. I think, you know, there's those stories of, uh, I forget if it's Shivnath Shastri or one of the younger generation coming to him and asking him to join uh, one of the new associations that's coming up, and he's like, no, I, that won't you, won't, you won't achieve anything, you'll just sit around and argue with each other, right? So he has a kind of skepticism about him which is what Melinda Banerjee was also saying about Ramahan, had this kind of skeptic side, even though he had a, a very deist kind of theological side, that people are complicated. But, um, and I think towards the why aren't the masses in the streets kind of, I think that may be partly Ashok Shen's concern is that, that he wasn't organically connected to the people, that it maybe had to do with his class position, his caste position and all of that, and in that colonial moment, the bifurcation was perhaps even stronger. Literacy rates were not nearly, we, we haven't reached full literacy yet in Bengal, but I mean, those days it would have been far lower, right? So the, this actual spectrum of people who are participating in some of these debates is more limited. But with time, you know, then you get the, the songs about Biddash Agar, they were circulating. And, and then later on, you know, these scroll painters and such take up his, so he percolates through into the popular consciousness, but maybe not in the level of that um, mobilization at a mass level. Uh, am I answering that? Yes. Yeah. That perhaps because he was made projected as a non-achiever in that sense by a group of thinkers, hmm. uh, when we were in school hmm. and even in college, we never read about Vidya Shagor hmm. as much as we did about Rabindranath hmm. and uh, also of Ambedkar to hmm. bring it down to yeah. ground yeah. reality. Hmm. I mean, these were again, I think, political policies of hmm. the particular period of time. Yes. You know, curriculum, after all, is in their total control. Yeah. So that's a very sad thing. Yeah. Thank you for helping us to discover <laughs> over the last three, four days so much about Vidya <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. <clears throat> Brian, I, you know, uh, uh, I was just curious to have your thoughts on something. Hmm. You know, this year is also uh, another anniversary that we are uh, mm -hmm. celebrating. Mm -hmm. uh, and the 50 years that separates these two men mm -hmm. also flag two different phases of Indian reform Absolutely. or the Renaissance yeah. or, or the quest for modernity as, as it were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, hearing your thoughts about the duality of Vidyashagar and, of course, all of these critiques about his elusive milestones, mm -hmm. uh, you know, can we also, uh, do you think that there could be parallels about Gandhi as well, mm. about this duality? Mm. Because, you know, there, there, there are also critiques about him, mm. about his being the Baniya Comprador, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, you know, the, 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 his role within a greater hegemonic framework of bourgeois uh, mm. <coughs> capitalist mm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, class. And the example of Gandhi also going back to the Shastras and saying mm. that, you know, for, for, for example, untouchability mm. uh, is not something that you have in this originary pure right, uh, right. breed of Hinduism and it is yeah. something of, of corruption, corruption imported yeah. by corrupt priests and, and, and so on and so forth. So, and he also, in a sense, gathers data by traveling. Mm. Uh, yes, so, so the, all of these, uh, so, this duality and the limitations and mm. the dare to know and, mm. and, and mm. to know when to dare, are these parallels with, to a greater or lesser extent, also applicable to Gandhi, in, who, yeah. who operates in a completely mm. different context, in a right. different right. political and economic mm. and social situation? Mm. So what would be your thoughts on possible parallels between yeah, these I mean, two figures? I think you can't, you can't look at the two men and not see those kinds of parallels. They're very striking. Even, even at the level of the physicality, their ability to walk, yes. they're, they're, you know, these are indomitable, yes. indomitable people. Yes. Yeah, and then the simplicity, then a doti chador, you know. They, and of course, Gandhi wrote respectfully about Biddha Shagar himself, right? Um, but 
Gandhi also had that bundle of inconsistencies. You know, he was fairly loyal in the early part of his, he was a loyal imperial subject and proud to be. I and mean, this is part of Bindashagar too, that there was this, again, this presumption that, well, British rule will be good for us and we'll, but of course there comes this Jallian Wallabag and these kind of crisis moments when that can no longer carry on as before. But then that connection with, with the masses and Gandhi had that sense of humor Yes, right? which is which is exactly. another commonality, I think. Yes. Which, yes. which, you know, so many of our, I mean, politicians use humor sometimes to affect a connection with people, but then there are people who just have a, what seems to be a, a genuine kind of connection to people through a sort of you know, humility. Someone said, I think, and sort of naturalness. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. No, I think absolutely. Right. And it's yeah. it's easy to see him as anti-modern, especially yes. because of the Hind Saraj. Yeah, yeah. But is there is there something of the ultra-modern about Gandhi? Do, oh, I think so. Think? I think so. I mean, it, but the same challenge is there. Well, that famous line, it takes a lot of money to keep Gandhi yes, in poverty, both. right? Yes, but yeah. poverty, yes. <laughs> And I'll, I'll say that no one ever said that about Bindashav, or at least he, yes. he was a, but he was like a true bourgeois self-made man, though, yes, right? And, yes, yes. But they both had that element, as you said, they're implicated in that rule of property. But Gandhi's whole, what, the project that he was advancing was one of simplicity and Swadeshi and Swaraj sure. and all yes. that. So that has to be a kind of ultra-modernity, right? And the, the question there is, why was that vision perhaps not fully realized mm -hmm. uh, in the India that is credited to Gandhi's kind of initiative, right? Yes. That's yes. that's probably the lingering question. Exactly. I would I would say. Yes. Yeah. Can yeah. I just say something here? Interject here, please. Uh, am I right in saying Gandhi was more political than Vidyashagar? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And even the but the context had changed significantly as. Professor Sengupta yes. mentioned, we're, we're 50 years on when Gandhi is active. Yes. And so we will, we, will have the, we will have the last question. We will have the last question for today. Yes, please. please keep your question brief. Yes. Hmm. yes. To, uh, to Professor uh, Sengupta, I am speaking. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, about uh, glorifying Gandhiji uh, in... Um, Two, uh, two, three years back in Accra, Ghana, Ghana's capital, Accra University, uh, Gandhiji's statue is broken down due to some unsavory uh, aspects of uh, telling about the Africans. Right. Thank you. Hmm. So, uh, sir, uh, is, is, is there a question? I mean, they, again, you have similarities hmm. between Vidyashagar has also been yeah. 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 <laughs> broken and demolished over time. Yes. And Gandhi too. Yeah. But see, it's the Accra. You know, there, there is, we, we are not going there, but there is <laughs> this whole debate about Gandhi's stance on Africans themselves yeah. uh, during his yeah. phase in South Africa. I mean, that, that, will, that will open up another. Africa right now. Yes. Yes, yes. So we will. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I think you had your bit, sir. So we will. Okay. We will, we will have one last, last question. Yes. I'm on the side, I'm being there. Oh, you missed it. I'm being discriminated. Oh, no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Brian, I just yeah. wanted to uh, thank you. And mm. as a theologist, mm. I'm asking your question in a different, mm. because you're chairing a chair of theology. Mm. Do you feel that uh, the, uh, you know, the fact that, I mean, Bidyashagar was a subject and the pressure of the colonial rule, mm. do you feel that being articulate, mm. just raising questions, just bringing things together, getting people together, was his major task? Was he really looking at solutions, like Gandhi? Or was he really looking at getting people together? Was he really looking at raising questions? And 200 years down the line, do you feel this is what we should be embodying even today? The articulation element of Bidyashagur. Yes. So, was he trying to bring people together? Yes, but I, I don't think in the way we think, again, Gandhi was mobilizing people and Gandhi was trying to create a, a unified movement in a sense. And again, as I said earlier, but Dashagar didn't seem to have that objective. He wanted to garner public opinion to agree on a particular set of problems, how to solve them. And in that sense, um, not just to raise awareness at a, at a kind of intellectual level, but he wanted in that very, as I said, practical sense, Here's a problem, this is the solution. I go to the government, I say, pass a law so that it is legal for Hindu widows to marry. 
Uh, now I'm going to try to get them to, right? So I, I do think that, that in that sense, it wasn't as much mobilizing a movement as affecting a kind of change. And in, in some sense, we maybe say that was a little bit limited, but he had his, he had his concern around these issues with respect to Hindu women, and that seemed to have been his major focus. Now, today you're saying, should this be what we, uh, articulation. Yes, why not, right? I mean, I think the identification of problems has to be a major part of a democratic society, right? That problems are articulated, people come to some consensus on them, and they seek remedies through their legislative bodies to, to correct them. I mean, that's kind of core of kind of representative democracy. As long as voices are heard and exclusion doesn't become the norm, right, such that uh, those, those articulating the problems and proposing the solutions only represent one portion of the population, perhaps, right? So. No, I think you. I, I think this 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 discussion can bleed into the tea that we will have outside. But I, I think you have had several rounds of questions, so mm. we will take one last question mm. for now. Yes. Uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I was just mm. wondering. I mean, when you think of Kant's essay on the Enlightenment, he mm. talks about this uh, the two ways of functioning. One, which is where you question things outside of. I mean, there is an independent yes. mind which questions things. There's public. And the, the private yeah. Kind of. So mm. and, and I was sort of going back to the earlier stage of your lecture today where you were talking mm. about the initial question that you had raised in your earlier book about uh, the religious yes. um, or the philosophical position that Bidda Shagor occupies. And mm. I'm wondering, I mean, whether it's also, I mean, I, I understand why it's important to decentralize that concern, the philosophical mm. uh, mind or, or the religious attitude that he has. But mm. do you think that that necessarily, I mean, that also feeds into the major Biddashago that you're talking about, mm. along with this idea of the republic of property. Mm. I mean, mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. uh, the, I mean, to think yes. about hegemonies, I mean, the entire religious, mm -hmm. um, whatever he's bringing with him, that adds to this major Biddashagor for me. And that doesn't really, I mean, stand in contradiction of the minor Biddashagor mm -hmm. as you are describing him. So, mm. I mean, I, I... Yeah, no, I think, I think if I'm hearing you right, absolutely that, and I and I I have to I have to go back through and write a new introduction to the book, and I have to think through exactly where do I stand on this question, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. But I do think you're you're right that the ma the major Bidashagar, as I said, is the one who who is oriented towards the dharma as a regulating framework for society, and the shastras are the embodiment of that dharma. And I think he feels, in particular, the shastras are the way to regulate what is deshachar, right? That we have this problem of a custom that's become popular, but we can address it, as he says very clearly in those tracks. You know, people just don't know the shastras. So if I make the shastric knowledge available to them in Bengali, then they can form their own, again, this is the articulacy again, make it available to them, then they can form an opinion about what the shastras actually say about this. And for him, shastra ranks higher as a, a pramana, as a norm of a of legitimate knowing than Deshachar, right? So if I can show you the Shastras say it, then, so that's the major Biddashagar, and that's a kind of project of a, and, and, that, and that's what I was doing in the book, is saying, well, that rep, I was basically saying he had a worldview oriented around this kind of Dharma, right? And I guess I'm not opposed to saying that. I think now I might nuance it by saying it's counterpoised with this minor element, right? Which, and I only just hit on this to when I began preparing this talk. It was a very, very new, Thought so. I'm, this is the first time I've ran it by anybody. So you're you're my guinea pigs, uh, but um, uh, so I'll go back and think a little bit more about it. But I, I do believe there's something there. Uh, hmm. uh, thank you, thank you so much, Brian, thank you for for, the for this uh, very you know very stimulating lecture, and then for dealing with so much grace and patience <laughs> for more than half an hour. No great questions. Of this bilingual grilling by. <laughs> Inquisitive guinea pigs. Sorry, my bangla <laughs> wasn't fair. fully up to speed, but <laughs> so um, so. I mean, thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you from all from all everybody. Well, I thank in this all talk. of you.